Well, good morning. Welcome to the Men's Bible Study. Again, this week, looking at the miracles of Jesus. My name is Matt Frey, one of the pastors here at PCPC, and a privilege to be with you again. Um, this morning, we are looking at the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. This is arguably the most famous of all of Jesus' miracles, um, certainly probably one that you are familiar with. Um, two reasons that this is maybe not only the most popular, but uh, the most important of all of Jesus' miracles. Um, first, the imagery of this miracle has connection points that relate to all kinds of scripture passages. Um, the imagery of the giving of food, the imagery of the giving of bread um, and fish or meat is rich throughout the scriptures. Um, you can think about how this event of, uh, of multiplying food and fish ties in with so many other feeding events in the Bible, key events in biblical history, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, the connection with the 12 baskets that are collected, uh, the Passover, the provision of manna in the wilderness through Moses, the feeding miracles of Elijah and Elisha in the prophets, um, the Lord's Supper that Jesus institutes uh, with his disciples, uh, the resurrection breakfast at the end of the Gospel of John, the marriage supper at the Lamb in the book of Revelation. There are so many layers of significance to how uh, this particular miracle um, has connection points with so much of Scripture and God's faithful provision for His people um, that make this a hugely important, if not the most important, miracle that Jesus performs. But a second and a more objective uh, reason to see this as the most important miracle is that this is the only miracle that appears in all four Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, John 6. In John 6, we have the most detailed explanation of the miracle. It's the, it's the longest, it's the most nuanced, it's the most rich with imagery. And in John's telling of the story, um, there are many similarities to the other three Gospels, um, but there are also some added insights in the Gospel of John and how John tells the story that really help give us a glimpse into Jesus' strategy for this miracle. And so we're going to look at two of those this morning, two reasons um, that Jesus performs this miracle. What is he after? What is he doing? Um, before we look at those two, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for a chance today to, to gather and to consider it. We pray as we read it, as we reflect on it, uh, that you would be at work speaking to us. Father, we need Jesus. We need Jesus to nourish us and strengthen us, to be bread of life for us. Help us to see the ways that we are too easily satisfied with, with other things in this life. Help us to see the depth of our need and how Jesus in his death and resurrection has perfectly met our need to be right with you. We pray that you would um, guide us, guide our thoughts, guide our words, and bless this time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I will read, um, as I've done before, read the verses of uh, the story as we work our way through it. Um, and as I said uh, before praying, this, this account in John really gives us um, an insight into what Jesus was after. Just the way John tells the story gives us some insights into what Jesus was after in doing this miracle before his disciples and before this crowd of people. Uh, the first thing that uh, uh, Jesus seems to be after in this miracle, his, his strategy in this miracle, is to strengthen our weak faith to strengthen our weak faith. And we can see this in the first 13 verses. Listen as I read um, to, to the wrestling and the weakness um, of the disciples' faith as Jesus raises the topic of feeding these people. 
Listen to how they, uh, they wander and they wonder, how, how can these people be fed? Uh, it points to their weakness of faith in Jesus' power to feed them. Uh, so beginning in verse 1, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he knew himself what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Um, you notice that Jesus in this scene, he's the one who initiates the conversation about the feeding of the people. He notices the crowd coming. He raises the topic of food for the people, how the people are to be fed. That's a little bit different than what we see in the other gospel accounts. Here, Jesus initiates the conversation in verse 5 and 6. Jesus asks Philip, where are we to buy bread? The reason Jesus asks Philip in particular is Philip is uh, a local. He is from that area of Galilee. And so Philip would have known the region, known the local businesses, known where to source the bread. Um, and Jesus proposes this question to Philip in very practical, very pragmatic terms. He doesn't ask Philip, how should we feed the people? He asks Philip, um, where can we buy bread? Um, it's not a question of where food would come from, as Jesus puts it, but where the money would come from or where the, uh, specifically where the bread would come from. Where's a local merchant? Where's a local market? Um, Jesus frames the question very practically, very pragmatically as a test for his disciples. That's what it says in verse 6. Said Jesus said this in order to test him, in order to test Philip. Jesus knew what he was going to do in providing a multitude of bread and fish for the people. But he was leading the disciples down this way of thinking practically, thinking pragmatically about the scenario to see would they look at the situation with eyes of faith in Jesus or would they look at the situation with the eyes of man wondering how the people would be fed, where to buy the bread, how to distribute it, how to organize. Um, would they be dominated by those practical, pragmatic concerns, or would they remember and reflect what they've seen Jesus do already, who they know him to be? So Philip's practical concern is, uh, is funding. Philip says to Jesus, he says, 200 denarii, which is a monetary value, um, a denarii is roughly equivalent to a day's wages, and so 200 denarii, we're talking about 200 days' wages for an individual person, a huge amount of money. 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little, and so Philip is dominated by the financials of the situation. Um, do we have enough money to buy that much bread? And then people would only have, even at that point, a little bit of bread. Uh, Andrew jumps in and he, he mentions that there is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but Andrew's practical concern is quantity. He says, uh, what are they for so many? What are these five loaves of bread and these two fish for such a great crowd of people? You and I, as, as guys, as men, are live in this world of practical, pragmatic concerns, whether you are leading your family, 
or leading a business, um, serving in an industry of some kind, um, we are dominated day to day by practical, pragmatic concerns. How do we fund certain things? Um, where do we get the tools and the resources that are needed for a particular event or task or project? Um, what kind of human resources are needed? Um, this is the, the stuff of work and the stuff of home life. Um, and so we can't fault Philip and Andrew for thinking practically. Many of us would even commend them for, for already thinking about the math and thinking about the financials, thinking about how much each person needs. Um, we as men are wired in that way, but Jesus was asking them to look beyond their, their male instincts or their male gifts um, and to think with the eyes of faith about this situation, about this scenario. Who did they know Jesus to be? Um, to be sure, food is a practical issue, but Jesus was wanting them to think of this as a matter of faith. Already, um, both Philip and Andrew have, have testified to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, he is the Christ. He is the Lamb of God. You can read that in John chapter 2 and 3 as Jesus calls the disciples to himself. They both testify to his divine identity. They have both seen him perform miracles, uh, miracles involving food and drink at the wedding at Cana, miracles involving healing. Um, certainly, they have uh, already arrived at the conviction that Jesus is the Son of God, that he does have divine power. They have seen those things demonstrated, and yet they slip back into thinking about this particular situation only in practical terms. Um, you and I do this on a daily basis. We evaluate our lives. We uh, have our own faith in God and trust in His Word dominated, shaped, ruled, not by God's promises, not by um, who God is and what He might do, but our faith is constrained and limited negatively by the practical realities around us. As we dream and think about um, uh, evangelizing a friend who is hard in heart, perhaps our minds are consumed with the fear of man. What will he think of me? Perhaps our minds are consumed with um, the immorality in the person's life or their own religious background and their hardness of heart. We think of all of the practical reasons why um, raising the conversation about who Jesus is and about, about the, the curse of sin would create difficulty in a relationship or um, tension in uh, a business partnership. We think of all the practical uh, obstacles in the way of uh, an evangelistic conversation. As we think about leading our families, perhaps thinking about um, the opportunity that we have from time to time to take a family on a missions trip or to, to go with a spouse on a missions trip. We think of, um, uh, as men, um, and I speak from experience, one of my first thoughts is, well, how is that going to be funded? And do I have enough days off from work? And if my child does this opportunity for a missions trip, um, what about missing out on other opportunities for, for sports or for camps or for other things? Um, our minds quickly, uh, quickly get dominated by practical concerns. Um, do we have the resources? Will it work? rather than viewing situations, viewing needs and opportunities with the eyes of faith. Who is God? What has He promised? What might He do for us in this circumstance? That's what Jesus was after with these disciples. And the disciples, Jesus tests them and they fail the test. They think only about it in practical terms. And so Jesus, in performing the miracle, is exposing their lack of faith. Um, he tells them to have the people sit down. He calls them to serve the people. He tells them to go gather up the remains. He wants them to experience and see their doubt, their lack of faith, and the great abundance of his provision 
for these people, um, arguably up to 20,000, 25,000 people. 5,000 is the number of men. Certainly there would have been uh, at this time others with them, wives, uh, women, children. And so it's this huge number of people. And so Jesus performs this miracle at, um, to confront the disciples with their own weak faith, their own tendency to, to trust in Jesus only according to the practical limits of their setting. Um, and you and I do this all of the time. The good news, though, is that Jesus continually does for us what he does for the disciples here. He doesn't push us away when our faith is weak. He accommodates himself to our weakness. He repeatedly, again and again, draws us into experiences in life where we are confronted with the weakness of our faith. Whether we are wandering in sin or whether we are th um, simply failing to take advantage of an opportunity before us that God has called us to out of fear or anxiety or worry or all the what-ifs that creep in, um, Jesus continually calls us into opportunities where we are called to exercise faith, where our faith um, in ourselves is weak, and when we see him graciously and powerfully provide. Jesus accommodates himself to our weaknesses. He did this for the disciples at the end of the Gospel of John. I mentioned earlier the connection between this passage and the, um, the resurrection breakfast meal that Jesus shared with the disciples at this same place on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. In John 21, he tells, John records this story. It says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Notice the correlation between bread and fish in John 6 and now here in John 21, again with his disciples. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. That account in John 21 was an account where Jesus was proving to his disciples his identity as the resurrected Messiah, the resurrected Son of God. Their rabbi and teacher, their friend, um, in his glorified body, but again using bread and fish, here accommodating their doubt that he had really been raised from the dead. In John 6, accommodating their doubt that he could really feed them. And so even though our faith is weak and we struggle with that, Jesus continues in our lives, both uh, through the stories we read in his word as well as the experiences that we live in our lives, Jesus continually accommodates himself to our weaknesses and reveals to us again and again his divine power. Think of Ephesians chapter 3 and how our minds need to be ruled by these kinds of promises, not the practical barriers and circumstances of our lives. Our minds need to be set and ruled by promises like this. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That is where we as men must fix our eyes and our hearts. Those are the promises which we must lead our families and our friends in. We must take up the shield of faith to believe God's promises are true. His power is real. Let us not think first of all of the obstacles. Let us think and remember his power and his promise to meet our every need. And so Jesus tells this story certainly to strengthen our faith, but he tells it also to deepen our shallow understanding. Um, strengthening faith is really seen in the response of the disciples 
Uh, deepening our shallow faith is really seen in the response of the crowds. Um, the crowds' faith in Jesus was shallow. Um, they believed in him having certain identities or uh, accomplishing certain things, but they didn't really grasp the depth of his identity as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as the atoning sacrifice for sin. We see it especially in verses 14 and 15. Let me read that for us. It says, When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now the crowds at the beginning of the story viewed Jesus as a healer, as a miracle worker, and he was and is. But that's why they were there. Um, it says in verse 2 that the crowd had followed him because they saw the signs he was doing on the sick. That's why they showed up on this hillside. That's why thousands and thousands of them had gathered, because he was a healer, a miracle worker. By the time they see themselves, this in miracle of incredible scale, and when each one individually benefits from the, from the eating of bread and the eating of fish and Everyone is a participant in the miracle itself. Um, their view of Jesus changes. He is not just a miracle worker by the end of the passage, but the crowds believe that he is a prophet. It says in verse 14, the prophet who has come into the world. Perhaps they're thinking of Moses' promise to send a prophet like him and the way Moses fed people in the wilderness and now Jesus was feeding people in this desolate place along the Sea of Galilee. Um, so they arrive at the conviction that he is a prophet come into the world. And then in verse 15, um, they don't verbalize this, but Jesus perceives in their hearts that they wanted him to be a king, um, to be king over them. Um, uh, certainly, um, they were not wrong to see Jesus in those terms. They were not wrong to see Jesus as a healer and a miracle worker. They were not wrong to see Jesus as a prophet. They were not wrong to, to want him to be king over them. Uh, Jesus is all of those things, um, and each of those things is significant. Uh, it's no light thing to have physical needs met. It's no light thing to hear from God. It's no light thing uh, to be freed from oppression. And so the people were not wrong in beginning to view Jesus in some of these ways. The problem was not that they viewed him in these ways, but that they failed to also see that he was the Messiah and the atoning sacrifice, the Lamb of God come into the world to save them from their sin. Um, their view of Jesus was too shallow, not deep enough. Jesus was here revealing himself as the promised Savior, the atoning sacrifice to which the Passover foreshadowed. You noticed, hopefully, um, at the beginning of the passage in verse 4, that Jesus performs this miracle during the Passover week. It says in verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And in the three years of Jesus' ministries, there was three Passovers that um, are described in the Gospel of John. That The first Passover in John chapter 2 is the scene in which Jesus enters the temple and sees all of the trading and commerce that is happening in preparation for Passover. And he turns over the tables and he drives out the animals and he laments angrily that this place of prayer has become a place of business dominantly. The third Passover in John 13 through 17, the third Passover is when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper with his disciples in the upper room. This is the second Passover. It's the middle of the three in John chapter 6. And he's revealing himself here in John chapter 6 as the sacrifice that is being offered in the Passover meal. If you remember from the story of Exodus, the Passover in the Passover meal, an unblemished lamb was to be slaughtered and his blood spread around the door frames of the Jews' house in Egypt on that night that the angel of the Lord came and struck down the firstborn sons of the Egyptians. And those with the blood around their doors, um, obeying the Lord's command as his covenant people were spared from that curse of death. Um, sacrifice was required for 
God's wrath to pass over the people um, and for their sins to be atoned for. And Jesus here in John 6 is pointing to himself as the sacrifice, as the bread that would be given, the bread that would be torn by his own body. Um, Really, you can't understand John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, and the feeding of the 5,000 and the significance of this miracle without also reading the end of John chapter 6. Read the whole chapter as a whole if you have a chance following um, our time today. In the end of John chapter 6, Jesus goes at great length to describe the ways in which the miracle of of bread being multiplied points to himself as the bread of life, um, as the true bread. Jesus tells um, his disciples, um, he says that, uh, and he tells the crowds, he says, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. Jesus is again telling them, don't look for um, the benefits, uh, the side perks of following me for a miracle or for food. Um, Look to me. Look to eternal life that is in me. And he spells it out towards the end of the chapter in verses 48 through 51. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. I mean, these were hard words, especially for the Jews to hear um, uh, that that Jesus was giving his flesh for people to eat. That was something that was um, seemed uh, impossible or nonsensical or violent to the Jews and to the crowds following Jesus. Jesus is speaking in a metaphor in certain ways, speaking of himself as bread, but he's speaking very literally that he would give um, the world his flesh. He's making a very strong allusion and foreshadowing of the cross where his body would be broken for the sins of his people as a sacrifice for sin on the cross. Jesus is seeking to deepen the shallow understanding of the people in this passage. He's seeking to deepen their understanding. He is not merely a prophet. He's not merely a king. He is the sacrifice that the Passover pointed to for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. He was the atoning sacrifice by his death on the cross. He is the one that would bring salvation to the Jews. That's represented in the collection of 12 baskets. He's the one that would bring salvation to the Gentiles, which many believe in the feeding of the 4,000, which is in Matthew and Mark, uh, other passages in Matthew and Mark, that he's the one that would bring salvation to the Gentiles. Um, Their seven baskets of leftovers are collected. He's the one that would perfectly and permanently meet our deepest personal need, not for food, but to be right with the living God, to be accepted, to be forgiven, to be welcomed by the King of Kings, our Creator, our Maker, to be welcomed by the atoning sacrifice of Jesus' broken body and shed blood. We live in a context of cultural Christianity here in Dallas. We too often have a shallow understanding of Jesus, maybe not as shallow as the crowds did, perceiving him only to be a prophet or looking him to him to be an earthly king. Um, perhaps we, we really do have saving faith in Jesus, but there's ways in which we still struggle to have a deep, robust, um, vital faith in Jesus. Uh, sometimes we give lip service to the idea of him being central in our lives. Um, But too often we view him as a means to an end for a meaningful life. Our problem is not that we think, uh, do not think of Jesus. We we think of Jesus in our context. Um, But the problem is that we think too little of him, that our faith in him is too shallow, 
too fleeting, too easily disrupted. We think too little of them because we think too much of other things. We think too much of the source of life and the source of security that we have through money and possessions. Or for us as men, through reputation and influence and the affirmation of our peers and families. And of course, we think too much, um, particularly today, of political leaders and political issues. Um, There are strong political overtones uh, in John chapter 6 leading to Jesus' perception that the people wanted to make him king. Did you notice what the body of water was called in this passage? It was called not the Sea of Galilee, but the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias. And again, it's called the Sea of Tiberias in John 21. Herod Antipas named this body of water the Sea of Tiberias, because he had named a particular town after the Roman emperor Tiberius, Tiberius Caesar. And so even as John names the body of water, he's introducing the ideas in the context of Roman rule. Jesus here at the end is perceiving that the people are seeing his great power, his great authority, and longing to make him king. Um, And So often, our hearts um, long for strong political leaders. We long for someone that we can respect and look up to, someone who can give us a sense of security, um, someone who can represent our needs in, uh, in government. And we long to have someone who is powerful and wise and good. We lament when We feel that there is not someone who is powerful and wise and good in offices of power. But we need to remember that Jesus has come not to merely give um, earthly blessings, not merely to be a means to an end. He has come to give us himself as the king marked by sacrifice. In the hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, which is a wonderful hymn, every single verse of the hymn as we are worshiping and lauding God for his glory and ascribing to him, to Jesus, um, kingly praise, every single verse of the hymn honors Jesus as king because he was sacrificed. One example real quick and we'll close. Crown him with many crowns. The second half of verse one says, Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as the matchless king through all eternity. Our king, Jesus, is not a king who would immediately come and overthrow Roman rule. He's not a king that would come and simply give us the freedom from oppression that we so long for in this earth. He is a king that comes to rule throughout all eternity, to rule as the king of kings and lord of lords, and he accomplishes his kingship over our lives by being the king sacrificed for us, the one who died for us. Jesus is king in a general sense, yes, because he is the creator and conqueror, but he is our king because he became the bread of life, because his body was torn for us. That is how the king becomes our king. That is how we go from seeing Jesus' power and seeing his miracles from afar to being able to receive him personally, trusting in him as our Savior. Our deepest need in this life is not food. Our deepest need in this life is not a good earthly king or ruler. Our deepest need in this life is not money or possessions or status or influence or a good marriage. Our deepest need in this life is to have our souls reconciled to the living God. And that comes not by our works. That comes only by Jesus, the bread of life, coming down from heaven, being torn and broken for us, and giving himself to us. In two weeks, we are, for the first time since the COVID pandemic began, in two weeks we are going to celebrate communion together as a church, Sunday, November 15th. And on that Sunday, we will 
be reminded in our liturgy as the, as the elements of bread and wine are given to us as God's people. We be reminded of the duty we now have and the opportunity we now have um, to feed on Christ in our hearts by faith. That is the way we receive Jesus. That is the way we continue to be nourished by Jesus, to receive him in our hearts by faith, trusting him despite our weak faith, growing to understand his power and his glory in our lives more and more, not being content with shallow faith. May God do that work as we feast together on the 15th, as we remember and reflect upon his word, as we encourage one another in our conversations. May we be driven to a faith in Jesus that is increasingly strong and increasingly deep for his glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises of your word. And we pray that you would grant us a faith that that outstrips what we see here in the disciples and the crowds. Help us to see you and to trust in you for all of your power and for all of your glory. And chiefly, um, to trust in you as our Savior, our Savior King who has died for us. We pray that you would give uh, our faith new life and new depths and new strength. Uh, in, season, in this season of incredible change and challenge, um, in a season of uh, social and political um, unrest, we pray that we would be um, content and secure to know you, the living God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our bread and our life eternally. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.